Well, welcome along to what is a special edition of the Unbelievable podcast this week, going out a bit earlier than the uh, radio show normally goes out, and that's because we're bringing you a highly anticipated debate that took place just last night on uh, Monday, the 17th of October, between William Lane Craig and Stephen Law. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the podcast today, and uh, I was hosting last night's event, and what an event it was. Uh, before we uh, hear the whole of that event in its unedited glory, I'd like to tell you about the William Lane Craig Reasonable Faith Tour in the rest of the coming week and uh, the week after here in the UK. Yes, uh, thanks to everyone who did attend last night. We had a packed house at Westminster Central Hall. It was the start of the Reasonable Faith Tour here in the UK. Runs till Wednesday the 26th of October. And uh, don't forget that there are a number of events you can get along to if you weren't able to be with us at Central Hall last night. Bill is appearing in Cambridge in Birmingham, again in London for the Be Thinking Apologetics Day conference on Saturday the 22nd of October. In Southampton, lecturing on evidence for the resurrection, he'll be in Oxford at the Sheldonian Theatre responding to the God delusion. And, uh, of course, there have been those buses running around Oxford asking whether there is going to be a Dawkins there, but stating there probably is no Dawkins. And um, uh, finally, in Manchester, actually tickets for that sold out already, the debate between Bill and uh, atheist scientist Peter Atkins, uh, but there will be an overflow room available on the day on a first come first serve basis where the uh, the, le- the the debate will be screened. <laughs> so um, do book in if you haven't already to at least one of those exciting events. Um, that's uh, Premier dot org dot uk slash craig for the tickets uh, you can find out all the general info at bethinking dot org so i hope you can get along to something on this very exciting and highly anticipated tour that began last night and it began with uh, a debate between stephen law and william lane craig so without further ado we're going to uh, let you hear that debate uh, and i'd be interested to hear what you thought about it don't forget you can email me unbelievable at premier dot org dot UK. You can also find the Unbelievable Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb. Same goes for the Twitter account at unbelievablejb. All available, of course, from the Unbelievable website to premier.org.uk slash unbelievable, where we host a whole variety of debates between Christians and atheists and Christians and other worldviews. So uh, if you're interested in the kind of debate you're hearing today, it's a great place to go for resources and for more audio uh, on these kinds of features and debates. Premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Uh, Right, well, let's hear uh, the debate that took place last night on the question, does God exist in front of a packed house? And uh, this is me introducing our debaters for the evening. Joseph Schubert once said, better to debate a matter without settling it than to settle a matter without debating it. Now, tonight, we don't expect to settle conclusively the question, does God exist? But we will hear the best arguments for and against the existence of God. And then you'll be left to decide who's made the most persuasive case and what to do with that information. As I often say on my radio programme, This is a show that aims to get you thinking, and the same is true for tonight. And I've tried to foster an environment on that program where both sides of the argument can be heard and the listener can make their own considered decision. And whatever perspective you come on tonight on the question of God's existence, I hope that our speakers inspire you to further delve into and think about this most important of questions. Does God exist? Speaking in the affirmative tonight that God does exist is William Lane Craig. He is Research Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, La Mirada in California. He's the author of over 30 books and over 100 peer-reviewed philosophical papers. He's well known for debating atheists all over the world in defense of the Christian faith. Speaking against the existence of God today is Stephen Law. Stephen Law is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at Heathrop College, University of London, and Provost of the Centre for Inquiry UK. He also edits Think, which is the journal of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. And if you hadn't already guessed, he's our atheist debater for today. Please welcome our debaters.
Now, a quick word about the format of tonight's debate. Each debater will give an opening speech, setting out their case for and against the existence of God. That's going to be followed by two rounds of rebuttals against each other before each side sums up their own arguments. Then Bill and Stephen will join me for a 30-minute discussion down here in front of the podium in light of the debate. Now, we'd like to feed your questions into that time. Now, rather than taking questions from the floor, uh, we've decided in order to include as many questions as possible that we're going to ask you to write down any questions you may have during the course of the debate. And I hope you may have got one of the paper slips for that purpose in your hands. Um, those will be collected during the second round of rebuttals, and I will remind you before that round begins. And uh, they'll be passed on to me so that I can sort through them and uh, introduce some of those into our discussion time. Anyone who uh, bought a ticket on the door tonight, you will have filled out a registration form, should still have that with you. If you could hand that in with the question forms, that would be excellent. Whether or not you've filled in a question form, if you could hand in your registration form, that would be very useful. Um, obviously, I won't be able to read all the questions out, I'm afraid, but we hope this way more questions will be able to be included than would otherwise be possible. And so we begin tonight's debate, Does God Exist? And speaking in the affirmative, please welcome to the podium, William Lane Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Let me begin by thanking Premier Christian Radio for inviting me to participate in this event this evening. And I also want to express my appreciation to Stephen Law as well for his participation. During the years that Jan and I lived in England, uh, during my doctoral studies at the University of Birmingham, we grew to have a warm affection for this country and for her people. And so it is a sincere joy and a privilege for me to be participating in an event like this. And I thank you for coming. Now, in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First, that there are good reasons to think that God exists. And secondly, there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now, I'll leave it up to Dr. Law to present his arguments for atheism before I respond to them. In this opening speech, I want to sketch briefly three lines of evidence in favor of God's existence. As a professional philosopher, I think that God makes sense of a wide range of the data of human experience, including philosophical, scientific, moral, and historical considerations. Number one, then, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Did it have a beginning, or does it just go back and back forever? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are good reasons, both philosophical and scientific, which call into question that assumption. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past is very problematic. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But the real existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. To give just one example, suppose you had an infinite number of coins, numbered one, two, three, and so on, to infinity, and I took away all the odd-numbered coins. How many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins, or an infinity of coins. So, infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away all the coins numbered greater than three. Now how many coins would you have left? Well, three. So, infinity minus infinity is three. In each case, I took away an identical number of coins from an identical number of coins and came up with self-contradictory results. In fact, you can subtract infinity from infinity and get any answer from zero to infinity. For this reason, inverse operations like subtraction and division are simply prohibited 
in transfinite arithmetic. But in the real world, such a convention has no sway. Obviously, you can give away whatever coins you want. Here's another example of the absurdity of an infinite past. Take the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Suppose that for every orbit that Saturn completes around the sun, the uh, planet Jupiter completes two. If Saturn has completed 10 orbits, Jupiter has completed 20. If Saturn has completed a trillion, Jupiter has completed two trillion. The longer they orbit, the farther Saturn falls behind. If they continue to orbit forever, they will approach a limit at which Saturn is infinitely far behind Jupiter. But now, turn the story around. Suppose Jupiter and Saturn have been orbiting the Sun from eternity past. Now, which one will have completed the most orbits? Well, the correct mathematical answer is that the number of their orbits is identical. But that seems absurd. For the longer they orbit, the greater the disparity between them grows. So how does the number of their orbits magically become identical simply by making them orbit from eternity past? These and many other examples suggest that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This purely philosophical conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe. But the bord guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state of the early universe which some scientific popularizers have misleadingly and inaccurately referred to as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have an absolute beginning. Of course, highly speculative scenarios, such as loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. Now, these models are all fraught with problems, but the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeed in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. But then the inevitable question arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? Some intrepid atheists have asserted that the universe just popped into being without a cause. But surely that's metaphysically impossible. For such a conclusion is, in the words of philosopher of science, Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being.
We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. Three, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Now from the very nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. It must be uncaused because we've seen that there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. It must be timeless and therefore changeless, at least without the universe, because it created time. Because it also created space, it must transcend space as well and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Now, there are only two possible candidates that could fit such a description, either an abstract object like a number or an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the transcendent cause of the universe is an unembodied mind. And thus we are brought not merely to an uncaused cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, objective moral values and duties in the world. Our first argument gives us a transcendent personal creator of the universe, but it doesn't tell us anything about his moral character. How can we know that he is good? My second argument addresses that question. Premise one states, if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. By objective moral values, I mean values which are valid and binding whether people believe in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values and duties are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, states, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory." End quote. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning, just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have developed similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has emerged among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality, which functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about this morality that makes it objectively binding and true. Certain actions, such as rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to show that rape is wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. Given atheism, the rapist who chooses to flout the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, a sort of moral equivalent of Lady Gaga, out of step with the herd. But that leads to our second premise. Objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. As philosopher Louise Antony so nicely puts it, any argument for moral skepticism is going to depend upon premises which are less obvious than the reality of objective moral values themselves. I was gratified to see that in his published work, Dr. Law affirms the existence of objective moral values, such as tolerance and open-mindedness. He rejects relativism as, and I quote, politically correct twaddle 
of a rather noxious sort. Rightly so. Actions like rape, cruelty, racial hatred, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're truly evil. Michael Roos himself admits, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are truly evil. But if that is the case, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Some people think that evil in the world provides overwhelming evidence against the existence of God. I think the exact opposite is true. Real evil in the world actually serves to prove the existence of God, since without God to ground objective moral values, good and evil as such would not exist. Number three, the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth our case so far gives us a generic monotheism affirmed by Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. But do we know anything more about who this God is? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was by all accounts a remarkable individual. Although Dr. Law has recently defended the claim that Jesus of Nazareth never even existed, Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. Now, most people would think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. And number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible, naturalistic explanation of these three facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that the best explanation of the evidence is that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. And thus we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. In summary then, I've presented tonight a cumulative case based on the origin of the universe, the existence of objective moral values and duties, and the resurrection of Jesus for thinking that the God of Israel, the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth, exists. If Stephen wants us to believe otherwise that atheism is true, he must first tear down all three of the arguments that I presented and then in their place erect a case of his own to prove that God does not exist. Unless and until he does that, I think that theism is the more plausible worldview. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, to present the case against the existence of God, please welcome Stephen Law. Thank you. 
Okay. <clears throat> my, uh, my thanks to the organisers of uh, this debate for the invitation to take part. I am I'm genuinely honoured uh, to be sharing the stage with uh, Professor Craig this evening. Um, we're here to debate the question, does God exist? And we've just heard some arguments that are supposed to justify an affirmative answer. I'll address those arguments in the first rebuttal period. What I'm going to do in my opening speech is to sketch out an argument against the existence of God. There are many such arguments. I'm going to make things relatively easy for Professor Craig by uh, sketching out just one. Uh, it's an argument with which I'm sure you're familiar. It's often called the evidential problem of evil. There's a great deal of bad stuff in the world. There are moral evils, the terrible moral deeds we do. There are also natural evils, such as natural diseases and disasters that cause humans and other creatures immense suffering. Let's start with uh, animal suffering. I recently watched a d documentary about Komodo dragons. Uh, they track for a week or so after poisoning their prey, and then finally, when their victim becomes too weak to defend itself, they disemboweled and ate it alive, this, this water buffalo, this poor water buffalo. The cameraman said that this had been his first ever wildlife assignment, and it would probably also have to be his last, because he just couldn't cope with the depths of suffering he had been forced to witness. Each day, millions of animals are similarly forced to tear each other limb from limb in order to survive. And this has been going on for hundreds of millions of years. This might in many ways be a beautiful world, but it's also a quite staggeringly cruel and horrific world for very many of its inhabitants. Some may dismiss all this animal suffering by saying that they're just animals. They don't ultimately matter. But I, I wonder if they'd say the same thing if I took a red hot poker to their pet cat. Then there's human suffering. Take, for example, the psychological suffering a parent must go through who has to watch helpless as their young child dies slowly of starvation or an agonizing disease. The consensus among population experts is that over the sweep of human history, prehistory, hundreds of thousands of years, the parents of each generation have had to watch, on average, between a third and a half of their under five children die, usually from disease. Kenneth Hill, director of the Hopkins Population Center at John Hopkins University writes, and I quote, over the long haul of prehistory, the probability of dying by the age of five for females was probably no long, lower than 440 per thousand live births and was probably no higher than 600. That's to say, on, a, on average, around half of literally millions of generations of girls never made it beyond their fifth birthday. This appalling suffering and death was not something these children and parents brought on themselves. Unavoidable, unspeakable horror on an almost unimaginably vast scale is built into the very fabric of the world we find ourselves forced to inhabit. So now here's the argument. If Professor Craig's God exists, then these hundreds of thousands, nay, hundreds of millions of years of horror must ultimately be, well, all for the best. For an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good God, one, will know about, two, will have the power to prevent, and three, will desire that the world not contain any pointless, gratuitous suffering. If Professor Craig's God exists, there must be not just some reason, but an entirely adequate reason for every last ounce of all of this suffering and horror. But surely, as we look back across the eons, we witness suffering of such depth and magnitude that it becomes highly implausible that it can all be fully explained away. In which case, it looks like very powerful evidence against the existence of Professor Craig's God. <clears throat> now, interestingly, a similar argument can be run against an alternative God hypothesis I want you now to consider. Suppose that... After a bump on the head, I become convinced that the universe is the creation of a single all-powerful designer. However, I also believe this being is evil. There's just one God and he's cruel, he's as cruel and evil as it's possible for him to be. Who believes in a creator like that? Hardly anyone outside of a mental institution. 
Yet notice that this evil God hypothesis is as well supported by, say, Professor Craig's cosmological and fine-tuning arguments. Sorry, we didn't run the fine-tuning argument today, it was just the three. The, his cosmological argument as his belief, is, as, as, sorry, as is, let me start again. Professor Craig's cosmological argument as his belief in his good God hypothesis. But that argument failed to provide us with any clue at all as to our creator's moral character. Yet still, I'm sure you consider the idea of such an evil creator absurd. Why? Well, one obvious reason for dismissing the idea is that our world is clearly not the sort of world an all-powerful and maximally evil being would create. Take a look at it. Yes, it contains suffering, but it also contains a great deal of good, far too much for it plausibly, plausibly to be considered the creation of such an evil being. Why, for example, would an evil creator intent on maximizing evil give us beautiful scenery to enjoy? Why would he allow people to reduce the suffering of others, sometimes quite selflessly? An evil god would want to maximize suffering and prevent morally virtuous behavior, so surely he'd clamp down on, say, Mother Teresa's activities straight away, and he'd destroy all the hospitals. Why, you might also ask, would an evil god bestow on some people immense health, wealth and happiness? David Beckham, for example, who seems to lead a charmed existence. And why would an evil god give us children to love? Evil god hates love. Surely the last thing he'd do is populate the world with endless bundles of joy. So you might think there is, on the face of it, overwhelming observational evidence against the evil God hypothesis. I'm sure some of you have spotted that what we're looking at here is, in effect, the evidential problem of good. If you believe in a good God, you face the problem of explaining why there's so much v bad stuff in the world. If you believe in an evil God, you face the mirror problem of explaining why there's so much good. So why, we might ask, if the problem of good is fatal to the evil God hypothesis, and surely it is, is the problem of evil not similarly fatal to the good God hypothesis? If one hypothesis is pretty straightforwardly falsified by observation of the world around us, why isn't the other one? Now, as you know, Christians have cooked up some pretty ingenious explanations for all the bad stuff. Uh, let's look at a few explanations, beginning with free will. Some Christians try to explain certain evils by saying that being good, God gave us free will, the ability to make free choices and act on them. Why? Because God wants to allow for the possibility of moral goodness. God could have made us puppet beings that or automata that always did the right thing, but puppet beings lack moral responsibility. Their good behavior, if compelled, would not be morally Good. So God cut our strings. He set us free. As a result, some of us choose to do evil. That's the price God must pay to allow for moral goods. I'm sure, sure you're familiar with that sort of explanation. But now notice that someone who believes in an evil God can mirror it with a free will explanation of their own. Evil God gave us free will. Why? To allow for the possibility of moral evil. Evil God could have made us puppet beings, automata that always did the bad thing, but puppet beings lack moral responsibility. Their bad behavior, if compelled, would not be morally evil, and so evil God cut their strings. As a result, some of us choose to do good. That's the price evil God must pay to allow for moral evils. You can see I've taken a standard Christian theodicy and just flipped it around. Here's another example of theodicy flipping. Some Christians try to explain pain and suffering as the result of the operation of laws of nature, laws that are nevertheless on balance supposed to be good. So, for example, a Christian might argue that without a law-governed universe in which the effects of our actions can be predicted, we can't morally interact with each other. Suppose I see you cold and hungry. In order to help you by lighting you a warming fire and cooking you a much needed meal, I need to know both that by striking a match I'll create a flame and that wood burns to release heat. Unfortunately, these same laws of nature have a downside. They entail that there will occasionally be, say, spontaneous forest fires that cause suffering. That's the price God pays for greater goods. Again, someone who believes in an evil God can produce a mirror explanation to account for goods. 
in order to allow the very great evil of my burning down your wooden house with you and your family inside, they may say, I need to know both that by striking a match I will create a flame and the wood burns. Such laws of nature are required for such very great evils to exist. True, these same laws have good consequences. They allow people to cook each other warming meals, for example. That's the price evil God pays for greater goods. We can similarly flip around familiar Christian suggestion that the pain and suffering we endure is there to allow us to grow and develop morally and spiritually. Yes, evil God wants us to suffer, do evil and despair. To that end, he introduces various goods into the world. But then why, you may ask, would an evil God allow a few people, such as David Beckham, to lead a charmed life? Why? to make the rest of us feel worse, of course. <laughs> to invoke feelings of jealousy and resentment in others, to motivate crime, riots perhaps. Why would an evil God pepper his creation with some beauty which we enjoy? Because he requires a contrast. In order to fully appreciate the drab dreariness of day-to-life, day life, we need to be reminded now and then of how much better things might have been. Why would an evil God give us children to love? Because it's only if we truly unconditionally love someone that we can be made to suffer as we do when evil God kills them slowly before our eyes. In short, someone might conclude this is not, as many Christians suppose, a veil of soul-making. It is a veil of soul-destruction, engineered by an evil God intent on crushing and breaking our spirits so that we bow out in agony and despair, as so very many of us do. While not all standard Christian explanations for evil can be reversed in this way, most can. Take, for example, explaining evil in terms of God's mysterious ways. A defender of belief in an evil God can adopt the same ruse, putting the God we see around us down to evil God's mysterious ways. After all, evil God is omnipotent and omniscient, isn't he? So, of course, his evil plans are likely to be largely beyond our understanding. Just because certain goods appear to us to be quite gratuitous, given his evil aims, gives us no reason to suppose that they really are gratuitous. Don't presume to know the mind of evil God. Moreover, just as some Christians maintain that whatever horror we experience in this life will be more than compensated for in the next, those who believe in an evil God can maintain that whatever goods we experience in this life will be more than compensated for by the far deeper, unremitting horror of the next. Clearly, despite these and various other ingenious manoeuvres that might be made in defence of belief in an evil God, it remains the case that there's far, far too much good stuff in the world for it to be the creation of such an evil deity. We can still, on the basis of what we observe around us, reasonably conclude that there's unlikely to be an evil God. So my question is, if the evil God hypothesis can, solely on the basis of observational evidence, be ruled out as highly unlikely, why can't we similarly rule out the good God hypothesis? True, we may not know the answer to the question, why does the universe exist? Perhaps we'll never know. It doesn't follow that we can't quite reasonably rule certain answers out. Obviously, we can quite reasonably rule out the evil God hypothesis and on the basis of what we can see around us. So why not the good God hypothesis? Why suppose, as I assume Professor Craig does, that the good God hypothesis is not just a bit more reasonable, but very significantly more reasonable than the evil God hypothesis? Well, remember, the latter hypothesis remains downright absurd, notwithstanding such appeals to evil God's mysterious ways and so on. <clears throat> That's the challenge I'm putting before Professor Craig tonight, to explain why belief in a good God is, on the basis of the available evidence and arguments, not just a bit more reasonable than belief in an evil God, but very significantly more reasonable than belief in an evil God. How might Professor Craig respond to this challenge? Well, he's given his arguments for his particular God, of course, I'll examine those ne next. They notice that the first one was completely neutral on God's moral properties, so it provides no support for a good God over an evil God. In fact, Dr. Craig is now down to two arguments. <clears throat> he may also try to dis disarm the problem of evil, perhaps by invoking a smokescreen of skepticism and mystery. He may say, well, we just can't presume to know, regarding all the horror we see around us, that God lacks adequate reasons for it. 
But as we've just seen, we can use the same sort of smokescreen to defend belief in an evil God. We can say, well, we just can't presume to know, regarding all the goods we see around us, that evil God lacks adequate reasons for them. So Professor Craig cannot, by means of such a smokescreen, show that belief in his good God is better supported than belief in an evil God. It will be interesting to see, I'll be interested to see, how he thinks it can be shown to be better supported. Now, that went really fast. I'm left with two minutes, and I just want to add in my two minutes, if it's okay, something that's on the desk. I'm just going to reach over and get it. Because Professor Craig mentioned it. But, um, but you know what? I'm going to leave this till later. I'm just going to stop now, <laughs> give Craig a bit of extra time, and uh, I'll talk about it afterwards. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. <laughs> You are not required to use all your time. We only ask that you stay within the time you've been given. Well, you've heard the opening speeches. Now it's time for Professor William Lane Craig to make his first response. Thank you, Stephen, for that very thought-provoking and uh, interesting uh, argument. You remember in my opening speech, I said that I would defend two basic contentions tonight. First that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. We've yet to hear Stephen's response to those arguments. My second contention was that there are not comparably good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now, Stephen has offered one argument for atheism, basically the problem of evil in an evidential version. Is this a good argument for God's exist non-existence? Well, I think not. Now, certainly, the terrible evil and suffering in the world is the greatest emotional obstacle to belief in God. But as philosophers, we're called upon to say not how we feel about a subject, but what we think about it. And when I think hard about the problem of evil, it turns out to be extraordinarily difficult for the atheist to prove on the basis of the evil in the world that God does not exist. We all know cases in which we permit suffering because we have morally sufficient reasons for allowing it. What Dr. Law would have to prove is that it's impossible or highly improbable that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. But how can the atheist possibly prove that? Maybe only in a world suffused with natural and moral evil would the maximum number of people come to freely know God and find eternal life? You see, on the Christian view, the purpose of life is not happiness in this world, but rather coming to know God personally and so find eternal life. And many evils may be utterly pointless with respect to producing happiness in this life, but they may not be pointless with respect to producing the knowledge of God. Dr. Law would have to show that there is another world which is feasible for God in which there is a greater knowledge of God and his salvation, but with less suffering, and that's pure speculation. Now, I think Dr. Law's own example of evil God actually proves my point. Now, first of all, uh, it's inaccurate to call this being an evil God because God, by definition, is a being which is necessarily good. Peter Millikan, professor of philosophy at Oxford University, says what makes the supreme being worthy of worship is not simply his power, but rather his moral excellence. For the supreme being to be an appropriate object of religious attitudes, therefore, he must, above all, be morally good. So you cannot have, literally speaking, an evil God because he would not be worthy of worship. What you could have would be an evil creator of the universe uh, who is not God. And I would argue that just as you cannot prove that the creator is evil because of the bad things in life, so you cannot prove that he is good 
because of the good things in life. The two cases are on a par. Just as good things don't disprove the existence of anti-God, so bad things don't disprove the existence of God. I think Dr. Law's mistake is that he thinks that the theist arrives at the doctrine of God's goodness by an inductive survey of the world's events, and that's simply incorrect. As Michael Bergman and Jeff Brower point out in their response to Dr. Law, traditional theists have never argued for God's perfect goodness by simply inferring it from the existence of some good in the world. Rather, what the theist can do is to present a moral argument, such as I have done, for God as the foundation of objective moral values. And that leads directly to the final point I want to make on this. Moral evil actually proves the existence of God. For we may argue in the following way. Premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, evil exists. Three, therefore objective moral values exist. Some things are evil. Therefore, God exists. In the end, Dr. Law admits, and I, I quote, I quote, it's possible that a cogent moral argument along the above lines might yet be constructed. I suspect that this is the most promising line of attack for theists to take. And this is precisely the line that I've taken in my published work. To summarize then, number one, Dr. Law cannot prove that God lacks morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evils that occur. Two, his anti-God objection fails because I agree that the good things in the world fail to disprove anti-God. And three, evil in the world actually proves God's existence because apart from God, there is no foundation for objective moral values. Now, let me say one more thing about animal predation and suffering, since this featured largely in his uh, argument. Number one, animals are part of a broader ecosystem in which the human drama is played out. And such an ecosystem must be balanced if it's to be viable. It is no accident that every ecosystem involves predators of some sort. For example, I also recently saw a program on television about how the Canadian authorities are reintroducing wolves into the wild in Canada. Why? Because in the absence of these predators, the caribou herds were overpopulating because there was none, no one to pick off the diseased and the aged, and as a result they were overgrazing and therefore dying of starvation. The predators actually enhanced the survivability, and the health of the caribou herds on which they preyed. So that predators are an essential part of an ecosystem. In a world without predators, the insects would soon take over since there would be nothing to eat them, and all the animals would soon die because all the vegetation would be consumed by insects. Uh, and once the insects have consumed all the vegetation, they would die off as well. So any viable ecosystem needs to have predation in it in order to succeed. Now let me say one other thing, however, that uh, is a result of recent scientific discoveries that shed remarkable light on the problem of animal suffering. In his book, Nature Red in Tooth and Claw, published by Oxford University Press, Michael Murray explains that there is really a threefold hierarchy of pain awareness. On the most fundamental level, there is simply the reaction to stimuli, such as an amoeba exhibits when you poke it with a needle. It doesn't really feel pain. There's a second level of pain awareness, which sentient animals have, which is an experience of pain. And animals like horses, uh, dogs, and cats would experience this second level pain awareness. But they do not experience a third level pain awareness, which is the awareness of second order pain that is the awareness that one is itself, uh, himself in pain. For that sort of uh, pain awareness requires self-awareness. And this is centered in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, a section of the brain that is missing in all animals except for the higher primates and human beings. And therefore, even though animals are in pain, they aren't aware of it. 
They don't have this third order pain awareness. They are not aware of pain, and therefore they do not suffer as human beings do. Now, this is a tremendous comfort to those of us who are animal lovers like myself or to pet owners. Even though your dog or your cat may be in pain, it really isn't aware of being in pain, and therefore it doesn't suffer as you would when you are in pain. The problem is that we are so often guilty of anthropopathism. That is to say, we treat animals as though they were human beings. We think of the deer in the forest like Bambi, having human consciousness and self-awareness. And this is simply fallacious. Uh, there's an actual name for this. It's called the hyperactive agency detection device, the tendency to regard animals as though they were agents. But once we understand the biology of animals, what we see is that God, in his mercy, uh, has spared the animal world the experience of suffering, such as human beings exhibit. So I think that this goes a long way towards solving the problems that Dr. Law uh, indicates. In any case, those three points remain. He cannot show that God lacks morally sufficient reasons for the suffering in the world. His anti-God objection fails because goodness in the world doesn't disprove anti-God. And in any case, evil in the world actually proves the existence of God himself. Thank you very much. If I could just encourage anyone not to call out during the uh, speeches, that would be very helpful. Thank you. And just a reminder that if you have a question, now is the time to write it down as we'll be collecting those in after this uh, round as we invite Stephen Law for his first rebuttal. <clears throat> okay. Um, good. Well... Uh, Professor Meg made, made, made some interesting points to I'll, I'll respond to them as, as many as I can in the time available to me. First of all, Professor Craig seemed to be suggesting that I think Christians think God is good because you know, they draw that conclusion on the basis of what they see of the world around them. Well, obviously, that's, <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, he's, he's attacking a straw man at that point. I assume that Christians have some other reasons for thinking that God is good because it's pretty, it's pretty obvious from what we see of the world around us that it really does not support that belief. That's certainly not why I think that Christians believe that God is good, not at all. So that, that, that was just an attack on a straw man. It's not my position, very obviously. Um, secondly, uh, Professor Craig says, suggested, and indeed suggested in his opening speech, that evil... The existence of evil proves God. It's, um, it's a popular move, I mean, not taken terribly seriously in philosophical circles, but uh, more widely, you do find this on the internet. You find people saying this. They think, oh, this is a good persuasive argument. They say that, in a way, the existence of God, sorry, the existence of evil proves that there's a God because it's only if there's a God that there can be such things as good and evil. Um, well, first of all, that argument begs the question, that you know you need God to have good and evil, and that Professor Craig has seemingly failed to do this evening, but I'll explain why that is so in, in a short period of time. The, the more important point is this. You can run the evidential problem of evil without mentioning evil at all. You don't need the concept of evil. I, as an atheist, don't need to buy into the concept of good or evil. I could be a moral nihilist. All you need uh, is the observation that there's just an enormous amount of suffering, far more than can be plausibly explained in terms of God's you know, mysterious ways or higher purpose. Um, that's all I need to point to. Uh, Christians can buy into the concept of good and evil. I don't need to in order to run the objection. And in fact, that's, that's, you know, this is widely recognized to be true. You can set up the problem of evil without even using the concept of evil. You don't have to buy into the concept of evil to run it. So that, that's, just, that's just a red herring. Okay? Um, his other... It's not true that evil proves God. Um, his other main arguments seem to be that... Well, basically, to concede that you can't be pretty confident that there's no evil God on the basis of the amount of good that we see around us. 
well, yeah, it is clearly. We all know that's not true. <laughs> I mean, we can see that there is an immense amount of good stuff in the world, and it's just implausible that, you know, it can be squared in some way with the existence of an all-powerful and supremely malignant deity. Uh, yes, there are all these ingenious explanations we can concoct and gerrymander, but the fact is, we can all see, we all know, and we will confidently dismiss, rightly so, the evil god hypothesis purely on the basis of what we can see of the universe around us. And if we can do that, then why can't we do it for the good god hypothesis? Professor Craig has not answered that question. That is the challenge I'm setting. In order to avoid the challenge, he's basically having to get incredibly sceptical. He's really having to play the mystery card at this point and say, oh, we just can't know whether there's an evil god on the basis of looking at the world around us. Really? Pull the other one would be, you know, my response to that. And if we can show beyond reasonable doubt, I'm not using the word proof, I don't like it, beyond reasonable doubt that there is no evil God on the basis of empirical observation of the world around us, then why on earth can't we show that there's no good God on the basis of empirical observation of the world around us, the sheer quantity of bad stuff that there is? That's basically the challenge I'm putting forward, and it seems to me that Professor Craig is just having to play a, a, a highly implausible, sceptical card in order to try and get himself out of trouble at this point. And that's the best he can do at this point, is that we can't know. We couldn't possibly know that, uh, whether or not there's an evil God on the basis of uh, observation of the world around us. I just don't buy it. Um, Professor Craig has um, also run, um, I forgot at which point he did it now, but he has run an afterlife kind of uh, explanation. He said that, uh, you know, the evils we experience in this world become easier to understand for a theist once we remember that we can, you know, look forward to an eternity of bliss in heaven. There is a higher reason, there's a higher purpose. It's not all about life here on this planet. Um, such, exp as I've already pointed out in my opening speech, such afterlife type explanations can also be run by someone who believes in an evil God. They can insist that the goods we experience in this life will be more than adequately outweighed by the horrors of spending eternity in the company of the supremely malignant deity in the next. Clearly that's not good enough as an explanation, as a defense of reasonableness here. The, you know, belief, your, the belief that belief in an evil God is, 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 is reasonable. And if, if it won't do in defense of belief in an evil God, then why on earth should we find it remotely plausible in as, as a defense of belief in a good God? So I can't see that Professor Craig has really got a decent response here at all. In fact, I mean, many of the moves that he usually makes have just not cropped up, interestingly, probably because he can see that they're not going to work once we start thinking about the evil God hypothesis. It's a very simple challenge we can see, on the basis of observation of the world around us, the sheer quantity of good stuff that there is, that there's more than enough to justify the conclusion that there is no supremely malignant, all-powerful deity in charge of the universe. And if that is true, then it just won't wash to say, oh, but, you know, we, we can't know that there isn't a good God because perhaps there is some deeper reason for all of this horror that we see around us. Um, it's clear that there is sufficient evidence, I think. And it seems to me, I mean, the really, what I find most baffling, I think, is, 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 is the extent to which people just can't see that. And the extraordinarily convoluted maneuvers, intellectual maneuvers that they have to go through in order to try and convince themselves that what they believe is not, given the available evidence, downright ridiculous. So I think I've dealt with most of Professor Craig's points. He also made some appeals to uh, some explanations of all animal suffering, which basically were variants of the appeal to laws of nature, which I've already pointed out. You can you can flip those type those kinds of theodicy. Um, I'm not going to do. I'm not even going to attempt to do so now. But uh, we, we could do that. So I, that that I think I think I've covered most of the points I wanted to make there.
Um, let me just repeat. I think that Professor Craig's point is we're just not in a position to judge with any confidence that it's improbable that God lacks morally good reasons for creating or allowing all this suffering. He argues that our failure to, to discern God's reasons is not a good reason to suppose that God doesn't have them. Perhaps in some way we cannot fathom they contribute to our eternal salvation. But as I've pointed out, much the same reply can be made by someone who believes in an evil God. Evil God is also omnipotent and omniscient, so of course his reasons are also likely, largely, likely to be largely beyond our ken. Those God's goods that seem gratuitous with regard to the aims of an evil God may not be um, gratuitous at all, I might argue. Show a little of humility. Don't presume to know the mind of evil God. If this sort of sceptical smokescreen doesn't succeed in salvaging belief in an evil God, then I fail to see why it salvages belief and creates good God either. Well, we reached the third round uh, where there'll be an opportunity now for William Lane Craig to respond. But as I mentioned earlier, if you have a piece of paper with a question on, uh, there will be some ushers coming around at the end of your rows. And if you could pass those to the end of the rows, we'll collate those in order that they can be brought into the discussion time later on. And as I mentioned, if you have a registration form you filled in, then do pass that on as well. But let's have some silence as we do that, as we invite William Lane Craig Back to the podium as he responds again to Stephen Law. So far as I could hear, Dr. Law has yet to respond to any of my three arguments under my first contention that there are good reasons to believe that God exists. First, he has not responded to my argument based on the origin of the universe. At best, he would have to say, well, we don't know if this being is good who has created the world. And I grant that. You can't know that from this argument. But it is a strange form of atheism, one not worth the name, that admits that there is a beginningless, uncaused, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe. That, I don't think, deserves to be called atheism. So he's got to interact with this argument because the problem of evil doesn't refute it because it doesn't say anything about the moral properties of this being. Secondly, what about the argument based upon the existence of objective moral values and duties? Here, frankly, I was stunned and disappointed to hear him retreat from his affirmation of objective moral values in his published work to now regarding this as being non-objective. And then you've got to deal with the problem that the objectivity of moral values is more obvious than any argument for moral skepticism. The atheist philosopher Peter Cave puts it this way, whatever skeptical arguments may be brought against our belief that killing the innocent is morally wrong, we are more certain that the killing is morally wrong than that the argument is sound. Torturing an innocent child for the sheer fun of it is morally wrong, full stop. And that's why John Cottingham reports that there is an increasing consensus among philosophers today that some sort of objectivism is correct. The problem is that on atheism there is no explanation for the reality of objective moral values and duties, and that's what theism will give you. Thirdly, the argument concerning the resurrection of Jesus has not even been addressed in tonight's debate. So, are there comparably good arguments for atheism? Well, I made four points by way of response to his argument. First, he hasn't been able to show that it's improbable or impossible that God has morally sufficient reasons for the suffering in the world. And he really admits this. His only gambit is to say, well, yeah, that's true, I can't show that, but neither can you show that the evil creator wouldn't have uh, sufficient reasons for allowing good things in the world. Well, that's the second point. And I agree that you cannot disprove anti-God by just looking inductively at the good things in the world. The world is morally ambiguous, and that's not how theists come to believe in the goodness of God. Stephen Weikstra, who is an expert in the problem of evil, puts it this way. 
He says, any being, good or evil, big enough to make the heavens and the earth, gives a high conditional probability that we'd regularly be unable to discern that being's ultimate purposes for many events around us. So our actual inability to do so isn't strong evidence that those purposes or that being isn't there. Just as the inscrutable evil in the world doesn't give much evidence that there's no totally good creator, so the inscrutable good in the world doesn't give much evidence that there's no totally evil creator. You don't decide that question inductively. And this is Dr. Law's only defense of the problem of evil because he admits he can't give any argument to show that God lacks morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. What about my third point, that evil actually proves the existence of God? Here he says, quite rightly, you don't need moral evil to run the argument from suffering. You can just talk about pain and suffering. Quite right. But then that means you have to retreat from the affirmation of objective moral values in the world. If you do affirm there are objective moral values in the world, then you're immediately confronted with the problem of the objectivity of evil and its explanation. In his book, Humanism, Dr. Law says, and I quote, none of this is to deny that there is a puzzle about the objectivity of morality, about how it is possible for things to be morally right or wrong, independently of how we or even God might judge them to be. And he has no solution to this problem to offer. He is simply left without an answer to the problem of the objectivity of moral values and duties. So while it's true you can run a problem uh, of suffering without referring to moral evil, to do so you're going to have to deny the reality and objectivity of moral values and duties, because once you admit them, then you've got the problem of the moral argument. Fourthly, I suggested that animal suffering in the world is not as serious a problem as he thinks because uh, animal predation is part of a viable ecosystem in which this drama uh, is played out. And that in fact animals don't have this third order pain awareness of knowing that they are in pain and therefore they do not suffer as human beings do. And therefore this problem of evil I think, uh, though emotionally powerful, I grant it, is emotionally powerful philosophically it is very difficult to run any kind of a, a successful argument against God based on the evil and suffering in the world. Let me make one last point on this question. The fact is that any event that occurs in history, no, no matter how trivial, sends a sort of ripple effect through history so that God's morally sufficient reasons for permitting it might not emerge until centuries from now in another country. This was already understood in classical physics. James Clark Maxwell wrote, The rock, loosened by the frost and balanced on a singular point of the mountainside, the little spark that kindles the great forest, the little word that sets the world a-fighting, the little scruple which prevents a man from doing his will, the little spore which blots all the potatoes, the little gimule which makes us philosophers or idiots, every existence above a certain rank has its singular points. The higher the rank, the more of them. At these points, influences whose physical magnitude is too small to be taken account of by a finite being may produce results of the greatest importance. The fact is that when we see an incident of evil or suffering enter our lives, we are simply not in a position to say with any kind of confidence that God lacks morally sufficient reasons for permitting that to occur. We're simply not in a position to make those kind of judgments competently. And therefore, it's simply impossible for the atheist to show that it's improbable or impossible that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, particularly when we keep in mind the Christian concept of God and the Christian purpose of suffering. It is not to produce happiness in this life. I grant it. It is rather to provide a context in which people may freely respond to God and his offer of eternal life and forgiveness and come to know him. And it may be that only in a world that is suffused with suffering of a natural and moral sort that the maximum number of people would freely come to know God and his eternal life. Dr. Law would have to show that there is another feasible world available to God that has greater knowledge of God and his salvation than this world, but with less suffering. There's no way the atheist can do that.
And uh, we go on to the third, the second rebuttal, sorry, by uh, Stephen Law. I'm giving you an extra 30 seconds, Stephen, because there was a brief malfunction with the timer uh, that amounted to about 30 seconds extra. So if you'd like to come, we'll hear your third rebuttal. Okay. Uh, at this point, I want to actually look at the arguments that were given for the existence of God. Uh, there were actually only two that are relevant here in terms of, showing, of being arguments for a good God as opposed to, say, a morally neutral God or an evil God. Uh, Craig's moral argument is, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Objective moral values exist, therefore God exists. The vast majority of philosophers reject this argument. Take, for example, the Christian philosopher, Professor Richard Swinburne of Oxford University. Swinburne says, I cannot see any force in an argument to the existence of God from the existence of morality. So Professor Craig is putting up against a mountain of evidence against what he believes, that provided by the problem of evil, an argument that even one of the world's leading Christian philosophers finds utterly unconvincing. If Professor Craig wants nevertheless to run his moral argument, the onus is clearly on him to show that its premises are true. In fact, both premises are highly questionable. The first premise is again rejected by the vast majority of moral philosophers. What argument does Professor Craig offer for supposing that it is nevertheless true? It appears to be uh, to point out that an evolutionary explanation of why we believe rape is objectively morally wrong wouldn't make rape objectively morally wrong. Well, so what? I mean, we all knew that already. Uh, that doesn't show that the belief isn't or cannot be true given atheism. Remember, the onus is on Professor Craig to show that no atheist-friendly account of the objective truth of moral claims can be given. The fact that evolution provides no such account very obviously does not entail no such account can be given. The onus is on Professor Craig to show that all such atheist-friendly accounts are wrong, even the ones we haven't thought of yet. And don't forget, as theists so regularly do, that they needn't even be naturalistic accounts. So, so far, Craig has shown one atheist-friendly account is wrong. As I say, we knew that already. What if the second premise of Craig's moral argument, objective moral values exist? This is undoubtedly a belief that just seems obviously true to us. And indeed, I'll put it forward quite happily, but I'm willing to take it back later if I need to. Okay? Objective... Uh, it, the mere fact that it seems true doesn't guarantee that it's true. It seems like there are objective moral values. That isn't a belief we should abandon easily, but it's by no means irrefutable. Right? After all, we have a powerful impression that the Earth doesn't move. It doesn't, I mean, it really, really doesn't seem to move. But if we're given powerful evidence that it does move, and it's also explained why it nevertheless seems like it doesn't move, then the rational thing for us to believe is that our initially highly convincing impression was wrong. The moral is, even if Professor Craig could show that his first premise is true, he can't deal with the problem of evil by just digging in his heels and saying, but look, it really, really seems to us as if there are objective moral values, so there must be a God. When placed next to the problem of evil, Craig's argument does little to undermine the problem. Rather, it just combines with it to deliver the conclusion that there are no objective moral values. That conclusion would be further reinforced by an evolutionary explanation of why it would still seem to us that there are objective moral values, even if there aren't. Now, I don't doubt Professor Craig doesn't want to believe that there are no objective moral values. Hey, I don't want to believe it, but this isn't an exercise in wishful thinking. So even if its first premise were true, and he, Craig could show that, and he hasn't, his moral argument still hardly offers much of a riposte to the evidential problem of evil. Let's now turn to the resurrection argument. It turns on claims made in the New Testament that there was an empty tomb, that there were independent eyewitness reports of Jesus alive after the crucifixion and so on. The claim is that the best explanation of these alleged facts is that Jesus was resurrected by God. You should always be suspicious of arguments to the best explanation in such contexts. Let me tell you a story from uh, 1967. It's a UFO story. There were reports of a strange object appearing nightly over a nuclear power site in Wake County. The police investigated. An off a police officer confirmed it was about half the size of the moon and it just hung there over the plant. The next night, the same thing happened. 
the deputy sheriff described a large lighted object. The county magistrate saw, and I quote, a rectangular object looked like it was on fire. We figured it about the size of a football field. It was huge and very bright. There was, in addition, hard data, a curious radar blip reported by local air traffic control. Now, what's the best explanation of these reports? We have multiple attestation. We have trained eyewitnesses, police officers putting their reputations on the line by reporting a UFO. We have hard independent confirmation, that blip on the radar scope. Surely then it's highly unlikely these witnesses were, say, all hallucinating or lying or just saw a planet. Clearly, by far the best explanation, you might think, is that they really did see a large lighted object hovering close to the plant. But here's the thing. We know pretty much for sure that what was seen by those police officers was the planet Venus. Journalists arrived on the scene, were shown the object, and chased it in a car. They found they couldn't approach it. Finally, they looked at it through a long lens and saw it was the planet Venus. That radar blip was just a coincidence. What does this show? Every year there are countless amazing reports of religious miracles, alien abductions, ghosts and so on. In most cases it's not easy to come up with plausible mundane explanations for them. Sorry, it is easy to come up with plausible mundane explanations for them. <laughs> but not all, right? Some remain deeply baffling. So should we believe in such things then? No, for as my UFO illustrate, story illustrates, we all know that some hard to explain reports of miracles, flying saucers and so on are likely to crop up anyway, whether or not there's truth to these claims. That 1967 case could easily have been such a baffling case. So let's suppose that the biblical documents written a decade or more after the events they report, written exclusively by the devotees of a new religious movement, not even by first-hand witnesses detailing events for which there's pretty much no independent confirmation, constitutes really, really good evidence that there was an empty tomb and that the disciples did report seeing the risen Christ. Is that, in turn, good evidence that Jesus was resurrected? Evidence supports the hypothesis to the extent the evidence is expected, given the hypothesis is true and unexpected. Otherwise, the absolutely crucial point to note is this. We have good reason to expect some baffling, very hard to explain in mundane terms, reports to crop up occasionally anyway. Whether or not there are any miracles or gods or flying saucers. So the fact that an otherwise baffling, hard to explain case has shown up provides us with little, if any, evidence that a miracle has occurred. Well, now both uh, William Lane Craig and Stephen Law will have five minutes each to sum up their arguments tonight, starting with William Lane Craig. Thank you. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed the debate to my, uh, tonight as much as I have. I've enjoyed the stimulating interaction with Stephen. I argued tonight that there are good reasons to think that God exists. My first argument, based on the origin of the universe, has gone unrefuted. Therefore, we can all agree tonight that there is an immaterial, uncaused, beginningless, spaceless, timeless, enormously powerful personal creator of the universe who may or may not be good. That would be a very strange form of atheism. Secondly, I've argued that objective moral values and duties point to the existence of God. First, because if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. And here, Dr. Law's only refutation was to appeal to authority. He said, well, Richard Swinburne doesn't agree with this argument. Well, granted, Richard Swinburne doesn't agree with the argument. But those who do agree with this premise include atheists like Nietzsche, Russell, Sartre, Mackey, and manifold others. So if you want to appeal to authority, I can give a long list of atheists who agree that if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. One of these would be Joel Marx, a philosopher who uh, two months ago wrote a remarkable article called Confessions of an Ex-Moralist. He said, could I believe that the wrongness of a lie is any more intrinsic to an utterance than beauty was to a sunset? or wonderfulness to the universe. 
Doesn't it make far more sense to suppose that all these phenomena arise within my breast, that they are the responses of a particular sensibility to otherwise valueless events and entities? Someone else might respond completely differently. For me, such that for him the lie was permissible, the sunset, banal, and the universe, nothing but atoms and the void. And so Marx came to realize that as an atheist, he had to give up his belief in the objectivity of moral values and duties. He said, I used to think animal agriculture was wrong. Now I will call a spade a spade and declare simply that I very much dislike it and want it to stop. I am simply no longer in the business of trying to derive an ought from an is. It seems to me Marx is entirely justified there. In the absence of God, there just is no explanation that the naturalists can propose that would explain the existence of objective values and duties. And this is critical. As Shelley Kagan, a Yale ethicist, has said, this need for explanation in moral theory cannot be overemphasized. One of the things we want our moral theory to help us understand is how there can even be a moral realm and what sort of objective status it has. And Dr. Law simply hasn't offered anything, whereas the theist can offer a transcendent ground in God, his nature, and his commands. So I think that theism offers us a better foundation for the objective moral values that we all hold dear. What about the resurrection of Jesus? Dr. Law rightly points out that there are many uh, reports of paranormal phenomena, and these ought to make us very cautious in assessing miracle claims. But I would say two things. First of all, any claim must be weighed by objective criteria, explanatory scope, explanatory power, plausibility, degree of ad hocness. And I don't know of any natural explanation that passes those criteria as well as the explanation that God raised Jesus from the dead. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus, I think, is plausible because of the religio-historical context in which it occurs. It's not a bald anomaly occurring without a context. It comes as the climax to Jesus of Nazareth's own unparalleled life and ministry, a man who claimed to be the absolute revelation of God and the way to eternal life. If this man has been raised from the dead, then he has been vindicated by God in those allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. And therefore, I think these claims have a degree of plausibility that paranormal phenomena would not. So I think we've got good grounds for believing in Christian theism. What about atheism? Well, basically all we've heard is the evil God objection, but as I explained, you can't disprove the evil creator hypothesis just by appealing to goods in the world. Uh, and similarly, you cannot disprove the good creator hypothesis by appealing to evils in the world. Why? Because we're not in a position to judge with any confidence when some incident of suffering occurs that God has no morally sufficient reason for allowing it to occur. And therefore, I'm convinced that on balance, the weight of the evidence tips clearly in the side of Christian theism. And for that reason, I remain enthusiastically a Christian theist. And finally, I invite Dr. Stephen Law to come and present his final summing up. <clears throat> I, uh, I started out by pointing out that as we look back across the hundreds of millions of years of sentient life on this planet, we find suffering on a stupendous scale. For example, we humans have over many hundreds of thousands of generations had to watch a third to a half of our children die painfully in our arms. Immense suffering and horror are built into the fabric of the world we are forced to inhabit. My contention is that this suffering does constitute powerful observational evidence against Professor Craig's God. Even many Christians acknowledge it constitutes very, a very powerful intellectual threat to their belief. I've challenged Professor Craig to explain why, given this mountain of evidence, belief in his good God is supported by the evidence and arguments. In particular, why is belief in his good God better supported than belief in an evil God, which is clearly 
absurd, which clearly is undermined by observation of the world around us. Who believes in an evil God? Nobody. Why not? Take a look around you. Professor Craig has spectacularly <laughs> failed to meet this challenge. He's tried to explain, explain the mountain of suffering, of course. He appealed to the promise of an afterlife, but mostly he's just played the mystery card, played the sceptical card, insisting that God has his good reasons for unleashing hundreds of thousands of years of horror. It's just that we're not in a position to know what they are. All right, okay. <laughs> I pointed out these explanations can be used just as effectively to deal with the evidence against the evil God hypothesis. So obviously they, right, they fail to show that belief in a good God is better supported than belief in an evil God. Those moves are neutral. So Professor Craig is now going to have to rely on his arguments for a good God, if he's to balance things up at all, if he's to show that his belief is more reasonable than a belief in an evil God. But only two of his arguments are actually even relevant, so I ignored the first one. These are the, um, the arguments that he did offer for his good God were remarkably weak. He offered a moral argument, but such moral arguments, as I pointed out, are rejected by the vast majority of moral philosophers. Even Richard Swinburne thinks Craig's moral argument fails. But I wasn't relying on that for authority. I just pointed out that Professor Craig provided no justification for the first premise of the argument, and he still hasn't. He still hasn't provided a decent justification for the first premise of the argument. The argument has a very dubious first premise. If there's, if there's no God, there are no objective moral values. Why should we believe that? There's been no argument. But even if he could show that it was true, I pointed out he would not have succeeded in showing that belief in his God is reasonable, more reasonable than belief, significantly more reasonable than belief in an evil God. For, of course, when placed next to a mountain of observational evidence that there's no such God, his moral argument merely generates the conclusion that there are no more objective moral values. A conclusion that, while counterintuitive, can't just be assumed. So, in fact, Craig's moral argument kind of presupposes that he's already dealt with the evidential problem of evil. You can't use it against, as a counterbalance to, the evidential problem of evil. His other argument was the resurrection argument, which is, frankly, I mean, almost comically flimsy. Even many Christians, uh, including Alvin Plantinger, and again, this is not an appeal to authority, just to illustrate the point, consider it uh, terribly weak. So let's not lose sight of the weight of argument and evidence on either side of this debate. There is a mountain of observational evidence against Craig's God. He has signally failed to explain that evidence away. He's just played the mystery card. He offered a couple of arguments for his particular God, but they turned out to be at best, well, weedy. Indeed, both have high-profile Christian critics. The moral argument relied on a premise for which we've seen no decent argument whatsoever. So I think it is indeed spectacularly clear where the balance of probability lies. We may not know why the universe exists, but we can quite reasonably rule certain answers out, such as that an evil God created it. We all know that. We can, for much the same sort of reasons, observational reasons, quite reasonably also rule out the suggestion that Professor Craig's good God created it. If any, that's the end. <laughs> if any of you want to explore the kind of argument I've sketched out tonight, please take a look at my paper, The Evil God Challenge, which is in religion. Well, that's another one. I'm not, we were talking about Professor Craig's God. Uh, in Religious Studies 2010, there's also a condensed version of that, of this argument, um, in my most recent book, should you wish to purchase it. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both Bill and Stephen. It's been a fascinating debate, I'm sure you'll agree. And we're going to move now into our discussion time. So if I could ask the helpers to come and move the uh, chairs and table into the centre. I've selected what I hope is a good representative sample of the many, many questions that came in. And I did say we'd never be able to get to all of them. But I hope that you'll agree that we're going to have a good discussion together. Just while the uh, furniture is being moved, I'd like to say that if uh, you pick up the podcast of Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio, you'll be able to hear this debate in full. And there were a number of people who uh, arrived a little late, and uh, so you weren't able to hear all of the opening 
discuss, uh, all of the opening premises. I do encourage you to go and find that at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable this week. Gentlemen, if you'd like to come down and we'll have a discussion together. Right. Can we all hear me? Is that uh, coming through pretty well? Excellent. <clears throat> well, um, obviously, today's debate centred a lot around the issue of evil and this particular argument that you've got going on, Stephen, uh, about the evil God hypothesis. I think we should start there and then maybe come to some of the other arguments that uh, Bill put forward for the existence of God. A lot of people have obviously picked this up and uh, a lot of people ask things like, um, to you, Stephen, your argument seemed to be based around the fact that the creator in question isn't necessarily good or bad. However, you are, seem to be suggesting a creator. Um, knowing this, how can you consider yourself an atheist and be sure that God, a good creator, doesn't exist? Yeah, he built by that too, didn't he? The, the, uh, oh, you're just conceding that there's a, a neutral God. No, of course I wasn't conceding that. Um, I came here to, to talk about Professor Craig's God um, rather than some say more neutral God or multiple gods. There are all sorts of God hypotheses we might consider and indeed other hypotheses as to why the universe exists. Um, I'm uh, interested in cosmological arguments and fine-tuning arguments. Um, however, the flaw in them that I'm interested in so far as Professor Craig's God is concerned is the fact that they are completely useless <laughs> so far as establishing the moral properties of the creator in question. That is not to concede that they are good arguments. Of course it isn't. And Professor Craig was pulling a fast one when he suggested that I was somehow just conceding that there is a God and that he, that he had established that. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't conceding that at all. I was merely restricting the debate to his particular God and focusing on the fact that the argument that he presented, the first argument, gave us no grounds whatsoever for supposing that this creator, if he exists, is all good, any more than it gives us grounds for supposing that it's all evil. Bill, do you want to respond? Well, I would say in response to that, that since we both agree that the cosmological argument, my first argument, doesn't even attempt to establish the moral properties of the creator, that means the problem of evil is irrelevant with respect to it. It doesn't offer any refutation of it. And that was what I meant when I said you tacitly concede that there is a creator of the universe in a debate context because you don't refute it. I mean, in a, in a debate context, to refuse to address and engage with an argument is to tacitly admit it. Now, obviously, I don't think you personally believe that there's a creator of the universe, but I'm, I'm trying to goad you into responding to the argument. Why don't you believe that there is a creator? You, I can see exactly... Mm, something strange happened there. I mean, the, thi the thing about this kind of argument is that I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a terrible argument, as are the vast majority of philosophers. But if you ask me, well, exactly what's wrong with it, give me the exact flaw so far as, you know, an argument for, as an argument for the existence of a creator is concerned, you know, I'm not sure. I change my mind from day to day about exactly where the real problems with it lie. But I'm absolutely confident that there are many significant problems, and we probably all know, we've, already, we've all talked about them on many occasions previously. We came here today to talk about Professor Craig's God, right, a very specific kind of God, and I just bracketed the argument because uh, it's irrelevant so far as establishing that there's a good God rather than, say, an evil God. It's just neutral on the moral properties, as, as you yourself have, have conceded. Yes, so I, I just I, but put I, it to one side. Rather than see that as a deficiency of the argument, I find that to be an attractive feature of the argument because of its modesty. It doesn't mm. try to prove all of the attributes of God. It gives us the ones that I mentioned, personal, enormously powerful, timeless, spaceless, uh, immaterial, transcendent cause of the universe, but it doesn't address the moral issues. So that's why I see it as part of a cumulative case. Yes, as you know, where I'll, I'll yeah, supplement but it's it. Actually, it provides no cumulative content at all, so far as establishing that there's a good God as opposed to a not, not God. Not that 
Well, it establishes that there is a personal creator who has these yeah, properties, but, no but it doesn't address the moral. But no human force whatsoever, so far as settling that issue. Not concerned. as far as the moral so is concerned. I mean, what so often happens in, in these debates is that people, atheists, allow themselves to be sucked into detailed conversations about exactly what's wrong with the cosmological argument and, fa and lose sight of the larger structure of the argument, such as the fact that even if it were true that there is some sort of creator, there is nevertheless abundant evidence that it's not an all-powerful, all-good God. Um, and so, there, you, it's, it, in a way, you can create, and I'm not accusing you of this, Bill, but you, it is possible to create a kind of smoke screen, immunizing smoke screen about, around your belief by conjuring up questions about exactly what's wrong with the cosmological argument and then, dis, and then distract people's attention away from the elephant in the corner of the room, which is, even if you could show that there was some sort of creator, it ain't that one. It, pardon me? Even if you could show what? <laughs> it, it's not your one. It's not that it, it, one. It's, it's not, not the good God if, yeah. if there is yeah. a creator. In the same way that we can right. be absolute. It's part of a cumulative absolute, case. But it makes no cum there's no cumulative case at all as so far as showing that it's, say, good rather than evil. And the challenge well, but, that but, I set but, up well, was let, to let explain... Me put, this question comes up. A lot of people asking a similar question. Why not, and this could apply to both of you, argue that God is simply neutral? Does she or he have to be good or evil? Um, I mean, and, and so Stephen appears to be saying here, Bill, even if I granted you the cosmological yes. argument, and we haven't heard his full objections to that yet, um, but even if I did, why assume it good rather than evil? As, as That's my argument? moral argument. Okay, yeah. See, so I'm, just I'm conscious of this, and so I offer a cumulative case where the first argument gives us a personal creator of the universe. Often I'll use a fine-tuning argument to give us a designer of the universe, a moral argument to give us some of his moral properties. And so you build a theologically rich concept of God through all of these various arguments. And this is the project of natural theology. This is the way it works. You, you uh, build a cumulative case for the existence of of God. But the problem is and to concede part of the case, I think, would be disingenuous for the atheist. He doesn't really believe there's a personal creator and designer of the universe. But then why not, if we've given a good argument? Okay, so Bill's argument then for the existence of a good God in particular, not just hmm. a creator God, is the moral argument that we apprehend these moral, objective moral values, and they can only exist in that way if there is, if you like, an objective moral lawgiver. Um, so, what's your, what's your response to that particular moral argument for the existence of a good God, Stephen? Well, um, well, just to recap, I mean, Bill's saying, well, I'm building a cumulative case for my God, but his first argument is just as good an argument for an evil God as it was for a good God, so it could make just as good a cumulative case for an evil God. Um, now, we're, now we're faced with the question of supposing, well, why is it a good God? rather than an evil God. Well, why suppose that belief in a good God is significantly more reasonable than an evil God, given that there is overwhelming observational evidence that, you know, actually there's neither. <laughs> neither of these two views is true. I mean, both of them face overwhelming observational evidence. Now, the only arguments that Professor Craig has presented tonight, well, as you see, Steve, is the resurrection argument and the moral argument. And the moral argument was, you know, if, if relied on a premise, the first premise of which you, 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 you spectacularly failed, I mean far worse than usual, spectacularly failed to produce a decent argument for it. And my point was that even if you had produced a decent argument for it, the argument would still actually be very poor when placed against the vast mountain of evidence that is the evidential problem of evil. Because even if you could show that the first premise is true, right, the evidential problem of evil combined with the first premise just delivers the conclusion that there are no objective moral values. And that may be highly unpalatable, but that doesn't mean that it's not Yeah, I, true. I, I don't see that at all. What there is overwhelming evidence for, Stephen, is that there is evil in the world. That's what there's overwhelming evidence for, and we agree with that, that there, that there is evil in the world. But my point is that objective evil, as opposed to objective good, doesn't plausibly exist on a naturalistic worldview because there is no explanation for objective moral duties, 
or values uh, in nature, whatever is, is right, and moral obligations and prohibitions would be utterly mysterious in the absence of someone to issue such prohibitions St or Stephen obligations. says you didn't support the first premise. Just outline the first premise of, of that the, the first premise is that if God did not exist, then objective moral values would not exist. Remember what objective means. These are moral values and duties that are valid and binding independently of whether people believe in them or not. And I'm suggesting that on atheism, there, atheism is explanatorily deficient because there's no reason to think that human beings are the locus of objective moral values any different than guinea pigs or mosquitoes or some other natural form of life, nor is there any reason to think that these funny primates have moral obligations or prohibitions. And this is a premise with which, as I said, a good many atheists agree. A number, of, a, a number of questioners did, did, did ask. Well, all of these arguments are controversial, yeah, yeah. Stephen. So, but you, you, you have a track record of appealing to, you know, to wheeling people out and saying this person believes it. And very often people who take you know, atheists in support of premises that you, yes. you favor. So you can hardly criticize me for, for, for doing exactly the same thing. No, no, what I, I tried to do is <laughs> one-up you on that, is, you know, you quote Swinburne, and I'll, okay, I'll right. quote Nietzsche, Sartre, Russell, and Mackey, you know, but, but the, the, the rationale is that atheism is explanatorily deficient with respect to a, a number of views. people mm. do ask in, in that's just an assertion of, isn't of, it? of you Stephen I mean, that's do, just do you believe in objective moral values uh, do I do Bill I believe in that them? he did he ascertained mm. that you do believe in them yeah no what I've said obviously is that I do think that there are objective moral values and you're quite right to pick me on that well, I've never said by the way that um, uh, I've never argued that Jesus doesn't exist no, I said you defended the claim. I was careful that Jesus about doesn't that. doesn't exist. That the, I, I said you defended the claim that something to the effect that Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist. No. In your argument, in your article in Faith and Philosophy, you give that yeah. seven-point yeah. argument. That, that's not what, that's not my view. My view is uh, the, the the argument that I gave in that um, piece in Faith and Philosophy journal was that. Um, there looks like it, it looks like there's a good philosophical case for remaining neutral. Um, I mean, we just can't be sure one way or the other, and that's not at all the same thing as defending the view that there was, that Jesus wasn't a historical individual. So, I, 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 all right. some so more agnosticism subtle, about yeah. The so I was defending more of an agnostic. All right. position. I, I'd like to come back to the issue of the historical Jesus uh, in, in a little moment, but just I just wanted to pick you out on this. Duncan asks, why does Stephen Law? believe in objective morality. Why? So, yes. What, what, I mean, Bill obviously feels that you can't mm. believe in that on a naturalistic framework. There, there's no, you know, thing in which that resides. Yeah. Uh, what, what makes you believe that there are objective Well, the most obvious values? thing to say, it just seems like there are, isn't it? I mean, that's a very obvious thing to say. It seems like there are. Uh, uh, but that may turn out not to be the case, as I pointed out. How things seem ain't necessarily how they are. I mean, I, did, I was very careful to say we shouldn't abandon you know, that belief lightly. Of course we shouldn't. No. I mean, it's, it's a des desperately important belief to us. It might even turn out that we just can't give it up. <laughs> I mean, we may be kind of physiologically perhaps disposed to hold this belief in such a way that we just can't get rid of it, we can't shake it. But that's not, of course, obviously that wouldn't justify it and that wouldn't show that it's true. And it might be that a really good argument could be constructed for saying that actually the belief is not true. Now, as a matter of fact, I, I'm going with appearance. You're going with what? I'm going with appearance for the, yes. to, to begin with. I mean, it does certainly seem that way. If, if I'm given a really good argument for why actually I'm mistaken, then maybe, maybe I'll have to abandon it and that would be... That would be tough for me, but, but somebody's going to have to give me that really good argument. Right. And we didn't get it tonight. It would be rather like our belief in the reality of a world of physical objects around us. It appears to us that we are surrounded by physical objects. Now, we could be inhabiting a virtual reality, a body lying in the matrix, uh, thinking that we're here in Central Hall listening to this debate, when in fact we're not. But as Stephen, I think, has said, in the absence of some very good argument to deny the veridicality of our sensory perceptions, we're justified in believing that there are objectively 
existing physical objects. Hmm. And it's a similar with moral what, values. What I want you guys to get to the bottom of here, though, is, is if you both agree on this, yes. uh, it seems, why do you, Bill, hold that that means God does exist? And why do you believe that that doesn't follow at all, Stephen? Well, Perhaps as I've already said, I think it has to do with explanation. I don't see on atheism any explanatory basis for thinking that there would be objective duties, obligations, and prohibitions laid on me if there isn't any body to issue such prohibitions and obligations. Or I don't see why we would be bearers of intrinsic moral value any more than other primates. Uh, the only difference between us and them is a slightly more complicated nervous system. So, Bill, what, what's your problem with Bill's argument there, that you don't have any um, basis on which to, to found these objective moral values without a transcendent well, God? Saying there isn't a basis is just an assertion. And what we need is an argument. And in order for Bill to run his argument, he needs to show that the premise is, is true or very probably true. The premise, the first premise, that uh, if there's no God, then there are no objective moral values. And it's just not good enough to say rubbish and evolutionary account, which we all know is rubbish to begin with. He has to show, the onus is on you, Bill, to show that you know, there is no atheist-friendly account of objective moral values that can be constructed. You need to rule them all out, including even the ones that I haven't even thought of yet, that we have yet to think of. There are so many possibilities here, and they extend beyond even the naturalistic. Remember, atheists don't even have to sign up to naturalism. In fact, personally, I don't even sign up to naturalism as an atheist. So there are just so many possibilities here, so many answers that might be constructed. And just rubbishing one evolutionary account, which no one really believes anyway, that, that, that you know, the theory of evolution could provide an objective basis, um, it just goes no, makes no progress whatsoever as far as establishing that that, that, that first premise is true. And saying, well, I just can't see how, you, how it could be so, it ain't much of an argument. Well, I think it is a good argument when you can try to show that a view is explanatorily deficient, and then it's up to the proponent of that position to offer some sort of explanation. I recently got a referee's report back for a journal article submission in which the referee pointed out that the typical way of a philosophical argument, since you can't survey all of the possibilities, is to give an inductive sampling of possibilities for a view, show that none of them work, and then say, well, this suggests that on this view, uh, th this is not going to be tenable. And one. One. <laughs> Which is not much of an inductive generalization. Is it? No, no, I, I, any, sort of, any sort of view that lacks a personal moral lawgiver, it seems to me, isn't going to have but that's, it the, seems to you, all, you've, do, all yeah. you've done is discredited one single account, which I would have agreed with you, you know, at the very beginning, was terrible. You have made some other, you, you, you've hinted at some other suggestions, the, well, the, like the, why would animal, why are we different to animals? The, the single family? account, though, is atheism. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to say that there could be a plurality of theistic moral theories, but the one that I, I think is explanatorily deficient is an atheistic account because I just don't see any basis we, for we, doing We are going to have to move on to a, another subject. Okay, I think but in, in terms we, of the, I mean, pointing out that, that, for example, animals, I mean, animals don't have moral obligations, so you might say, so why do we then? Because we're just animals then on the atheist point of view. Well, no, we, I mean, we're obviously very, very different to other animals. We have hopes and desires and fears. We can appreciate music. There are all sorts of differences between us and other animals, including that we are rational and we understand that we do have moral obligations, which, of course, animals don't. Now, that would explain why it is that animals don't have moral obligations. Professor Craig may say, but that's not sufficient to show why we do have them. But in terms of answering that first question, why aren't we just like animals? Um, it's, you know, it's the first move, and it may be that there are, say, non-evolutionary accounts which appeal to our special features. The fact that we do, for example, we are rational, we do care about each other, we do, uh, I mean, th 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 I mean I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to offer a specific theory. I don't need to. In fact, I don't even need to defend the first premise, because as I pointed out, even if it were true, it's still a terrible argument when wheeled out against the evidential no, problem of evil. But even, even if, 
evil he, proves the objectivity of moral values. But we've already dealt with that, Bill. I mean, it, that, we do. I, I don't on need. That. I don't need to appeal to evil, to, to the concept no, I, of evil. In, that's in, right. As I you've agree. Like, so I can run the evidential problem of evil without Correct. using right. the term that's evil. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We let's move to something else. Um, one of the arguments you're best known for, Bill, is the cosmological argument, which you outlined at the beginning. You suggested that, uh, that Stephen hadn't really responded very well to that. Uh, Adam asks you, though, Bill, why is Yeah, that the, was an understanding. <laughs> yes, <but laughs> why, why, why is the absence of a logical explanation for the origin of the universe, why in the absence of a logical explanation for the origins of the universe do you posit the existence of God instead of concluding that there are simply fundamental limits to human understanding. Why God, instead of just saying, yes, well, we just don't know? I didn't actually conclude to God. <laughs> Careful now, I didn't actually <laughs> conclude to the existence of God. What I concluded is that the argument shows that there's an, an uncaused, beginningless, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe. And I gave arguments for all of those. So it's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical deduction from what it would be to be a cause of the universe. It, it seems to me that the atheist's best hope would be to try to refute the premise that the universe began to exist. But once you grant that there's an absolute beginning of the universe, then on pain of saying the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing, there must be such a being as I've laid out. Well, a number of people had the question for you, Stephen, uh, Abina included among them. Um, well, if you don't believe in God, what did create the universe? And, and another person asked, what about the cosmological argument? How do you respond, essentially, to, to Bill's contention that there has to be a cause? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to the question, why does the universe exist? Did you say, do, you, do you disagree that Bill's... Bill believes he obviously has a logical argument that suggests that there is a cause for the beginning of the universe, and that cause has to have these certain properties. Yeah, it, it looks. You, it, it looks. I mean, again, I'm not going to be steered into an argument, still steered into a discussion about first causes and so on, given that it's absolutely irrelevant so far as Bill, establishing that Bill's God exists, as opposed to say an evil God exists. This argument, even if it was cogent, would provide as much support for belief in an evil God as it provides support the belief in a good God. And what the question you asked, Bill, was why does this show that your God exists? And, I mean, the only, the only answer, I think, was the moral argument, really, wasn't it? I mean, and the resurrection. The, the moral argument is, is and the, the main argument from the resurrection of yeah. Jesus supplement the cosmological and fine-tuning arguments to build a cumulative case for God's existence. I mean, obviously, uh, what we've heard time and again from Stephen this evening is that your cosmological argument doesn't tell us anything about the nature of God. Um, well, he doesn't say that. He says it doesn't tell you anything about the moral nature of God. And, of course, defenders of the cosmological argument have always recognized that. It's not intended to. It's n not that type of argument. Is, is it enough it's, for him to say we just don't know? No, no, that's not enough, because you've got to deny one of the premises if you're going to deny the conclusion. This is a deductive argument. You've either got to deny that the universe began to exist, or you've got to deny that if the universe began to exist, it has a transcendent cause. This is not a God of the gaps argument, uh, trying to postulate God to fill up the gaps in scientific knowledge. This is a philosophical argument, and the scientific evidence is just one of the reasons that I believe the premise is true that the universe began to exist. You, do you want to respond, Stephen? Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I know, I want to, I want to, I want to show a little humility here and say, you know, there are questions to which I don't know the answers, questions which may be in principle unanswerable. Um, as I pointed out, different from my response to the problem of evil. Well, we'll come to, we'll come to that. That's <laughs> because it's, it's very different. <clears throat> To say that there are questions that we can't answer is not to say that we can't rule certain answers out. What? Rule certain Granted. answers out. Granted. Right? Sure. So when I say I don't know the answer to the question, why does the universe exist? 
it does not follow that we can't quite reasonably rule certain answers out. And I take it that you think we could rule out quite reasonably belief in an evil God. And it seems to me that the vast majority of us will think that that is an eminently unreasonable belief to hold. And in fact, setting aside any other considerations, just looking around us at the character of the world that we inhabit, that provides us with very good ground. I don't say it proves it beyond all possible doubt, but it gives us a very powerful case for saying that there is no evil God, the amount of good. Have I, have I switched? I my... just disagree with that, and the, the, the philosophers that I have talked to also disagree with that. You know the article that you published by Bergman and Brower in Think, where they, they point out that Christian or theists have never concluded that God exists based on a sort of inductive survey of the goods in the world. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting that you should draw the conclusion that there is a good God or an evil God on the basis of what we do observe. I'm suggesting that you can rule out a good or an evil God hypothesis on the basis of what... So I'm not making the argument for it on the basis of what we observe. I'm, I'm suggesting that you can show that there isn't a God with a certain kind of character on the basis of what we observe of the world around us. And it seems to me that we all know that that is true with respect to the evil God hypothesis. We all know that you can rule it out on the basis of just looking around you. There's just too much love, laughter, and rainbows that's for this to be. Purely, and to say that's purely an pure emotional thing. argument, Stephen. There, that's just no an assertion. Rigorous. To say it's a purely emotional argument, you have to show me what's wrong with the argument, well, I did. not just dismiss it uh, as emotion. Remember the point that I made from Stephen Weichstra an omnipotent being, an omniscient being who's able to control uh, the, the universe uh, will have ends and purposes for which we would not be in a position to yes. make any sort of probability judgment that this is a gratuitous good or that this is a gratuitous evil. So I think you yourself refute why an inductive approach to this problem won't work. No, I, I, if, if the, the point is that exactly the same is true of belief in an evil God. You can say exactly the same. You can play the same sceptical card right. to defend belief in an evil God. And we all know that won't wash. We no, all we know that's know. not good. Merely asserting, oh, you can't know, it's all a mystery, does not establish that that is so. You need to come up with an argument as to exactly why we cannot know well, on I the did. basis of looking around us at all the love, laughter and rainbows, that that is an extremely good evidence that there's no evil God. Merely saying, oh, you can't tell is not good enough. You need no, to I actually, didn't say that, you, well, well, good. So what actually is the argument for why we can't possibly know? Remember the point I made quoting James Clark Maxwell um, about our uh, cognitive limitations are such that when events occur in history, they send a kind of ripple effect through history such that God's morally sufficient reason for permitting it might not emerge in our lifetime, in our area. There's simply no way for us to know that a provident God doesn't have morally sufficient reasons for allowing this we, or that instance of suffering to enter our lives. I'm going to have to cut in, and we're, time is short. We've just okay. got a few minutes left. And I, I want to just at least touch on Bill's final argument. Um, and that was the resurrection. Kirsty asks, how would you, Dr. Law, respond to the argument of the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, I thought I did. Well, just briefly recap, if you would, for us, what your, your fundamental problem is with Bill's argument that the existence of God is proved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, my fundamental problem, really, is that I pointed out that people <coughs> report all sorts of things, um, and they're particularly prone to reporting miracles and ghosts and goblins and alien abductions and so on. Um, and sometimes we can quite easily provide a sort of mundane naturalistic explanation of why the reports are made. But other times we can't. We really, really struggle. And that 1967 case involving those police officers who saw an object over the nuclear power plant over several nights with a hard evidence, that radar blip, right, describing it the size of a football field over the nuclear power plant, that could so easily have gone down in the annals of ufology as one of the, you know, the great cases 
explain that, the ufologists would have said. Um, what, you know, what's the best available explanation for all of these different reports and that hard evidence for scope? Um, if somebody had suggested, well, maybe they just saw the planet Venus, you know, there would have been, there would have been an uproar. People would have said, you know, pull the other. I mean, how could that possibly just be the planet Venus? These were police officers. These were trained eyewitnesses. Uh, they saw it night after night. There was the hard evidence, the scope. Um, this would have been extraordinarily embarrassing for them. Imagine the risk they took by even reporting it if it then turns out that they were just talking about the planet Venus. So, so, so it's easy to run a best explanation argument in that context that looks quite plausible, but actually, taking a step back, we know that there are going to be many such cases historically, well, a handful of them anyway, that are very, very hard to explain in mundane terms. Is that evidence that, you know, we are visited by flying saucers or, or whatever. No, because we know that those kind of cases are going to crop up. I'll just ask anyway. One and if the evidence is, is expected anyway, right, then it's whether or not the hypothesis is true, then the evidence does not support the hypothesis. Just ask for one brief response to that, Bill, and we will have Well, just to one very draw, brief response draw, is that yeah. one of the remarkable things about the resurrection of Jesus is that it wasn't expected. This is so un Jewish, so uncharacteristic of the Judaism that the disciples followed and the concept of the Messiah that they embraced as Jews. In that sense, it's not like people who crave miracle reports, healings, and other paranormal phenomena. The unexpectedness of this is one of the things that I think is difficult to explain and, and uh, provides warrant for it. We are going to have to, I'm afraid, draw things to a close there. Would you join me in giving a round of applause to both our <laughs> guests today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Well, I, I just want to thank you for coming out tonight again. Thank you for joining us today. As I say, this, this uh, debate available through the programme, unbelievable. Um, and don't forget that you can enjoy many other events from Premier and you can find out more information on the tables as you leave. And I do hope you've enjoyed tonight. Again, a round of applause for our guests. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, a special edition of the podcast going out early in the week. Sorry, it does mean if you're a regular listener to the Unbelievable podcast, you'll have to wait a bit longer than usual um, for the next one. Um, but I'm actually going to see if we can possibly put out some of the main events, the debates in particular, um, as special podcasts anyway in the coming weeks. So you don't have to wait too long to see them uh, online, as it were. Um, they were the, all the events are being filmed for the Reasonable Faith Tour, and they will all go online um uh, so where you can view them on youtube etc uh, although th the dvd is being made of the be thinking conference on october the 22nd that that is going to be released as a dvd in the future so watch out for that um but in the meantime thank you for listening to the podcast today don't forget more resources available and the ways to book in of course at the unbelievable website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable i'm justin briley and i hope you can join me as usual for the podcast same time next week all the best now until then hope to see you on the reasonable faith tour